Everyone hangs on a cross one way or the other. For since sin has entered this world, every person is guaranteed to suffer and die, and there's simply no escaping that future. And tonight, I invite you to consider to yourself, which cross will you hang upon? One of the most interesting things to think about in the crucifixion account, while there's much to consider, is the different people's reaction to the events and ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ Himself. We can think of the disciples swearing great allegiance and courageously that they will die with Him and ultimately failing at the last moment. We can think of Peter going that extra step beyond his compatriots and following Christ only to deny Him when challenged. We can think of Judas, who if he ever had a curiosity or faith about Christ, lost it and betrayed Him for money. We can think of the chief priests who couldn't care less whether Jesus was innocent or guilty, but only that He posed a threat to their central God, themselves and their power, and thus He must be eliminated. We can think of Pontius Pilate, who saw Jesus as probably an inconvenience at the most, and while he saw Christ's innocence, was willing to sell it out to keep the peace. We can think of those Roman guards who, given the opportunity to mock and abuse a Jewish peasant who had claimed to be the king, was the perfect opportunity for them to show that Rome was, after all, completely dominant over them, the greater state, the greater nation by far, and thus to take that out in the most graphic fashion upon this would be king of the Jews. And of course, we can think of the crowd, so easily directed. For while certainly the uh, chief priests and scribes and the Pharisees were at the center of the conspiracy to imprison Christ, there can be little doubt that there were some on Palm Sunday sounding, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, while others that would later shout, crucify Him crucify Him. But the reactions that we'll evaluate tonight concerns one of, the difference, uh, one of the differences between the gospel accounts, and we'll note that differences are not contradictions. We see that Matthew records only that two thieves cruci were crucified uh, by Jesus, and they both mocked Jesus, and that's all He tells us, that these, uh, these, these condemned thieves and deciding to gain some last bit of bitter pleasure, sought to deride and tear down another person in their same circumstance. Perhaps it was even some sort of sad distraction from their moment of pain and torment to spew forth hatred towards someone else. Yet Luke gives us sort of a zoomed-in perspective on this situation. Surely both of the prisoners, both of the thieves were uh, pouring out abuses and hatred upon the Lord. But one of the sh thieves, we're told, changed his mind, had a change of attitude at some point. Perhaps it is as he beheld the grotesque hatred of man poured out before a person who'd been stuck to a cross. Perhaps it was just the exhaustion of his approaching death that caused him to be only slightly more reflective than the other. But he begins to rebuke the other because he recognizes that Jesus was innocent, whereas they were on their crosses from earned results from crimes that they had committed them and no one else. And he tells the Lord a very simple yet significant statement. He doesn't say, I'm sorry for, for you. He doesn't say, my, you have it rough, or oh, isn't this unfair. Instead, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This means that this poor thief who is gaining the just results of his crime 
recognized in that moment that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. We can't say what he saw or didn't see, heard or hadn't heard along the way. Surely, as they were preparing for their crucifixion, these two thieves, there was hubbub and um, bustle around, noting that there would be a third to be crucified with him and maybe a chance to hear his story. But even more so, we know that Jesus was a sensation in his time. And that over the three years of his ministry, that everybody would have heard of him and undoubtedly of his messianic claims. This shows that the thief knew and anticipated a future kingdom. That uh, one thing that Jesus affirms with his answer after a fashion. He knew that there would be a resurrection of the saints of Israel. This was common. This was from uh, Jan Daniel chapter 12. They knew that there would be a resurrection of the righteous saints of Israel to come and be a part of that kingdom period. At the end of the day, though, we find that he had a simple faith in Jesus as the Messiah. He surely knew little or nothing as to what Jesus was doing on the cross, except that he didn't deserve it. And yet, as we know Him, He's the last of the Old Testament saints of Israel that we know of that was saved before the start of the church. Jesus responds to this thief by saying nothing of the kingdom, but instead telling him today, that very day, he would be with that, or that man would be with him, rather, in paradise. Paradise here, standing for the place of the righteous dead, corresponding with the Old Testament bosom of Abraham and Sheol. So to that day, that very day, he would not go into the kingdom, but that very day he would go a poor sinner, a thief on a cross to the place of the righteous dead. Now, some soteriology notes here on what we believe about salvation. There was no time for this man to sign a, sign a commitment card. He couldn't walk an aisle, even if he'd wanted to. He couldn't go through an alpha course. He couldn't be baptized, rededicated, nor did he have time to take communion. In fact, if anything, his crime would have had him imprisoned even to, uh, over the Passover so that he would have missed the high holy day of Israel that was to be the last time that he would be alive on this earth. Yet he was saved because he had a simple faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation in every era and every epoch is the same. Faith alone, by grace alone, by the work of Christ alone. So now we've seen two crosses. The first cross is the cross of the worldling. The worldling sat and continued to revile Christ and to reject Him. Think of the audacity. If you really are Christ, prove it. Prove it to, your, to, to the world. Prove it by doing something for me. If you're really God, take away my suffering. Take away my trial. Take away my difficulty. Sure, I was the one who stole and got myself on this cross, but you can prove yourself to be God by taking away my consequences of my actions. I'll believe you're God when you give me everything I want. But of course, this was a lie. Had Jesus granted that man to come down from the cross, we can guarantee he would have still rejected Christ as Messiah. He would not believe. The next time anything didn't go his way, it would be the same story. Prove to me that you're God and take away this sickness. Prove to me that you're God and take away this trial. Prove to me you're God and get me off the cross this time. How strange it is how close the attitude is for the willing unbeliever, or the willful unbeliever, to the one who understands how great their need. For we all stand guilty and helpless before God. But this one wanted help on his terms. He wanted proof and a solution, not for his greatest need, the need of sin that separated from a holy and righteous God, but rather he wanted his personal physical situation cured for the moment, with an empty promise of faith should it come. The second cross that we've seen is that of the humbled thief. 
This Old Testament saint chose to humble himself and look to Jesus as his only hope and chose to believe in him. Seeing his unworthiness, he asked only to be remembered when that kingdom time would come. And the Lord promised him an unworthy thief that he would be today in the place of the righteous dead with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and with Daniel. Those are the two crosses that we often consider at this time. Will you be like the prideful, spiteful worldling, like everyone today who rejects Christ? I'd believe Him if He proved Himself to me. I'd believe Him if He showed Himself to me. I'd believe Him if, I'd believe Him if, as I believe Him if. Or will we be like that humble thief who recognizes that there is no hope for us except for the hope provided in the next life by Christ? I don't need to remind you that there were three crosses on the hill of Golgotha that day. You see, in the church today, if a believer uh, does, uh, trusts in Jesus Christ, they don't just, we don't just receive hope for the afterlife. A change happens at the very moment when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and His death on the cross for salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 gives us a little bit of insight about what happens when we look to Jesus Christ, the one on the cross. It says, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of, the tr of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. You see, when a person, any person living today hears the gospel and chooses to, and puts their faith, believes in that gospel, they are sealed permanently by the Holy Spirit of God and made a guarantee, or the Holy Spirit plays a guarantee of that inheritance that yet is yet to come. We have a future hope when we put forth our faith in Christ. But something far more profound arguably happens. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, and gave Himself up for me." You see, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ today, then you are not like that second thief on the cross. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ today, the Word of God tells us that you were with Jesus Christ on His cross. God spiritually identified you with Jesus Christ in that crucial moment. And in that crucial moment, you died to sin. You died to your sin nature. In that crucial moment, when the blood of Christ paid the eternal penalty for your sin, you died with Him. It's exactly what Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. This isn't wishful thinking, nor vain spiritualism, nor ridiculous symbolism. It is a spiritual reality, and it is the actual declared truth by the very Word of God to every person who trusts in Christ. Not standing on looking, but there with Him. But not only that, if you've placed faith in Christ, we find that you're also buried with Him, immersed into His death. You're raised with Him and able to walk in newness of life, that resurrection life with each passing day. You've been raised and ascended and seated on high at the right hand of the Father, far above all powers and principalities, authorities and rulers. And any exercise or influence of the world, the flesh, or the devil, you, dear believer, for you, it is finished. It is completed. And nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Unlike the thief, or thief one, you will not die in your sins. And unlike thief two, your hope is not only a future hope, 
But now you live in a moment-by-moment -moment love relationship with the God of the universe through the permanent sacrifice of Jesus Christ, both now and on into eternity. This day that we celebrate on Good Friday that goes on into our Resurrection Sunday celebration is the pivotal moment. It is the place wherein your life was taken, your sinful life was taken from you, and your new life in Christ was given to you forever and ever. Amen. It may be easy to want to weep for the sorrows and the, and the pains of what Christ endured on our behalf, but far better to have your eyes filled with joy knowing that because of what Jesus Christ did, you will be with Him forever and ever. All of this because Jesus Christ came to earth and gave His life for our salvation. So I ask you this evening, which tree will you hang on?